I can go in a room and meet a patient for 10 minutes and tell them I'm going to cut them open from from their sternum to their pubic bone and I'm going to go and rearrange their insides and I'm going to take out their aorta and I'm going to replace it. Uh, and in a 10, I, I answer a few questions, talk to them about the risks and in a 10 minute conversation, they're like, thank you, doctor, let's get this done. But the minute I bring up a change in their lifestyle, especially related to nutrition, then they think I'm crazy. You will not find a longevity expert who will tell you that eating meat is the basis of living longer. I think that's telling. And I'm not talking about internet influencers. I'm talking about world-class PhDs from Stanford, MIT, and Harvard who have spent their lifetimes studying these things. And, and, and these are the conclusions they've made from doing hundreds and thousands of studies. The current healthcare system isn't about health, wellness, and longevity. It's crisis intervention and revenue generation. Welcome to the Crisco & Company podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lee Crisco, MD. Today, our guest is Dr. Rizwan Bukhari, who is a vascular surgeon with 26 years of experience. He is certified by the American Board of Surgery, and he is the founder of the North Texas Vascular Center. The reason we're really interested in speaking to Dr. Bukhari as a, is as a mainstream uh, medical doctor, he also has an interest in lifestyle medicine and whole food plant-based nutrition. Welcome, Dr. Bakari. How are you today? It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's always fun to uh, I, I engage and uh, and share our messages. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, how did you, as a conventional vascular surgeon, uh, fall into the whole food plant based lifestyle? You know, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, the uh, my training is very conventional Western medicine training, uh, where uh, we are taught to. Uh, treat disease. We wait for disease to occur, and then we treat it. And uh, and you know we're not really uh, treating the root cause of the the disease. We're tr just treating problems. Um, and um, uh, I've always been interested in my own health, uh, and so I've always thought I exercised. I kept a good weight. I ate I ate what I thought was a healthy diet, although it was a standard American diet. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, about uh, seven or eight years ago, my wife and I lived next to a Whole Foods, and we did that on purpose because we thought we're going to be eating healthy food from the Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day, my wife uh, asked me to go see this guy named Rip Esselstyn talk, and I didn't know who he was. And when she told me he was a fireman who was going to talk to me about reversing cardiovascular disease, uh, I was very skeptical about going. I mean, I was a little bit resistant, uh, but, you know, to be a good husband, I went along and I listened to his talk and, and I found it interesting and yet also disconcerting at the same time, because he was saying things that I had never heard of as a specialist in cardiovascular disease. Uh, he was saying that, you know, uh, this disease was caused by um, our lifestyles, by the foods we eat, uh, by our habits. And he was also saying that you could halt, prevent, and even maybe reverse disease. Uh, and, and this was so foreign to me because I had always just been taught, wait for the disease to occur, then fix it. And then my patients were repeat offenders. They would have disease somewhere else. I would fix it somewhere else. And I would get three or four or five different procedures out of every patient because the disease didn't stop. It just kept affecting new arteries. But, you know, uh, so I was skeptical. I walked away skeptical from that talk. But I think my mind was ready to hear the message uh, because of some frustrations in my practice in the sense that I felt like I wasn't truly making a big, I mean, I might've been helping save legs and lives and, you know, preventing strokes, but I wasn't truly treating the root cause of the problem. And uh, so at that point, I, um, I read the China study. 
uh, and I read uh, Caldwell Esselstyn's book, uh, uh, How to How to Revert, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. Um, I started to learn about the work of Dean Ornish, um, and at that point, and uh, uh, since I'm an extremely data-driven person as a physician, um, it really made a strong impact on me. Uh, and at that point, I personally uh, became whole food plant-based in my approach to lifestyle. Uh, my wife, who is already pretty much a pescatarian, uh, just flipped a switch and overnight, she was also whole food plant-based. Uh, and then and, and that's where we adopted the lifestyle. And that was about seven or eight years ago. Um, uh, but, and then uh, as a physician, I, uh, ethically, I couldn't just practice this lifestyle myself and, and not teach it to my patients. Um, and so that's when I began to learn a lot. I became board certified in, uh, by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, and um, I started to teach these uh, uh, lifestyle methods to my patients. And, and it really wasn't very different than many of the risk factor modifications that we often teach our patients, but it was very much more specific and detailed about how we can be better in our lives so as to um, prevent disease. And even if you have the disease, you might be able to um, uh, stop it in its tracks or even, even slow down the progression or halt it. And so it, this has become a mainstay uh, as a part of my practice of vascular surgery. I still, to this day, I do carotid surgeries. I do uh, bypasses and stents. I do limb most of my practice is limb salvage, but at the same time, an important component of my practice is sitting there and counseling my patients on how they can change their lives so that they can have better outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, how is it generally received by your patients to suggest, you know, moving towards a whole food plant-based diet? I mean, the, that's a really, that's a really good question. The thing it's is a, like, in, you know, in the United States, I mean, it is just so normalized to eat an incredibly bad diet where, yeah. you know, the percentage of foods that are sort of whole food, whole food plants is in single digit percentage numbers. Um, to, so when you suggest to people the whole concept of a whole food plant-based diet, it almost looks like you're from, you know, outer space or something. Um, yeah. How do your pet patients receive that? Well, I'll look at the smile on my face because yes, this is so, so true. Um, I, it's not well received. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I, I often use this analogy as a surgeon. I can go in a room and meet a patient for 10 minutes mm -hmm. and tell them I'm going to cut them open from, from their sternum to their pubic bone and I'm going to go and rearrange their insides and I'm going to take out their aorta and I'm going to replace it uh, and in a 10, I, I answer a few questions, talk to them about the risks. And in a 10 minute conversation, they're like, thank you, doctor, let's mm -hmm. get this done. Mm -hmm. But the minute I bring up a change in their lifestyle, especially related to nutrition, then they think I'm crazy a and I lose a lot of credibility with them. So it's, it's very frustrating that, uh, the, this, uh, these lifestyle things are so ingrained in our patients and mm -hmm. not just our patients, everybody, you know, in all, in all Americans, that it becomes a basic part of their belief set. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very hard to change that belief set. Now, part of their belief set is to go to the doctor and the doctor's going to do something, give them a pill or give them a surgery and fix them. And so they're okay with that, but it's not within their wheelhouse to accept that, hey, if you change these things, this thing you've been doing for decades, uh, you might change. And I, and I get it. It's largely a behavioral issue. And, and that's where it's very hard for physicians like you and me, who've been trained in a very traditional Western approach to medicine, which is the chronic uh, approach to, you know, to the treatment of chronic disease. Um, it's very hard for us to get our patients on board with a more proactive, preventive lifestyle. And so it's not very well accepted. I'll be very honest, maybe about one in 20 of my patients hears the message. Mm -hmm. And then out of those one in 20, there's a spectrum uh, where maybe one will completely adopt the lifestyle and the other uh, few will 
uh, make some changes for the better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, tr- I try to approach my patients not from the standpoint that they have to live a completely whole food plant-based lifestyle like I do, uh, but that they just need to improve their lifestyle. They need to incorporate more healthy foods into their diet, you know, eat more fruits and vegetables, eat more grains, eat more legumes. Um, and, and it's because our standard American diet is full of meat and processed foods, uh, which uh, and, and and most Americans don't get one serving of fruit a day or one serving of vegetables a day when we should be eating four or five of each. Mm-hmm. So it's to me it's like okay, start eating some more green leafy salads, eat more some eat some more fruits, uh, add broccoli, add asparagus, and uh, I think that that you know the, the, the beneficial effects of eating those is great, even if they continue to eat some uh, of the standard American diet. Uh, but it also tends to crowd out some of that standard American diet, uh, and they make a uh, a paradigm shift in the overall way that they uh, that they eat. And what I've seen with the ones who do adopt that is they see a change mm-hmm. uh, in in many ways. They they see that they're losing weight. They mm-hmm. see that their diabetes control gets better. They see that their hypertension gets better. Uh, they see that their cholesterol goes down. And what they see is that these things happen in a matter of weeks mm-hmm. uh, when they've been taking medicines for years and there hasn't been a change. Um, and so sometimes, sometimes when they see those changes, it just feeds upon itself and then it accelerates their uh, enthusiasm for that lifestyle and they continue on. So mm-hmm. those, are, those are the very satisfying ones. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, I mean, the vast majority of my patients don't. Um, take my advice, uh, and that's and that's frustrating. Yeah, I yeah, I'm, I'm I'm sure it is frustrating. I I don't have as much opportunity to speak with patients myself about nutrition, although occasionally I do. Um, you know, I think part of the problem is the bad nutritional behavior is so normalized, and in fact, the healthcare system actually participates in that. Yeah. Um, I rem- remember one time uh, I was working and uh, there was a, a fresh donut truck outside the hospital and they were uh, giving fresh made donuts to all the hospital employees. And uh, I had been up a portion of the night. I was kind of grumpy and disinhibited. And I <laughs> I went on a bit of a tirade about how the fact is, you know, they would never allow smoking in the hospital. It would be completely disallowed. You'd probably be arrested if you tried to smoke in the hospital. And yet there's more people that die from bad dietary habits than die from smoking now. Yeah, and, you know, absolutely. hospitals should not be participating in that. And yeah. In fact, where I work right now, they've got these big ice cream cones outside the hospital because uh, this is this, you know, self-proclaimed ice cream capital of the world here in, here in Iowa. Um, but uh you have, were actually, I'm sure you've had the same thoughts because you were quite vocal about there being a McDonald's in your hospital. You got some internet yeah. press about that. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, and that wasn't in my hospital. That was in the county hospital in Fort Worth. Okay. Mm. And, and my county hospital where I trained in Dallas back in the 90s, which was Parkland, had the busiest McDonald's in the world at that time. <laughs> really? Okay. really? Yes, yes. And I would, I, I, you know, I was still eating uh, a standard American diet. I would go in there, and there'd be patients with IV poles hanging, uh-huh. with, in their in their gowns with their bottoms exposed because you know how the gowns are with yeah. the, the ties in the back, and they'd be in line waiting to get their Big Mac meal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, but since then, McD- uh, 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 Parkland has taken a little bit more proactive approach. Uh, I wouldn't say that they're perfect, but they have made some um, um, some great strides in the right direction. Now, this other protest was at J- uh, John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth, which is their county hospital. And, uh, you know, uh, I worked with uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which I'm a, a member of and a strong supporter of. Uh, I, I, In fact, I do some diabetes talks for them online and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and. You know, so we went out. We've done several protests. I, I spoke personally, spoke to the board uh, of JPS, um, and we're trying to make a difference and help them understand. Now, I think the reality is they do it for the money. 
Yeah. They make money. And, um, you know, they know, uh, they know if they put in something healthier, they're not going to make as much money. And that's a sad commentary on our hospitals that yes. they're willing to make money off of uh, uh, promoting the poor health of mm -hmm. our patients. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in my own hospitals, um, I have a fair amount of influence because I'm very involved in the medical uh, staff hierarchy and structure. I was a former chief of staff uh, where I am now at Baylor Sunnyvale, and I do have lots of talks with them. I have had a strong influence in them adding every single day there's a vegan meal on the menu now, which there didn't used to be. Um, and there's several uh, vegetarian veg, vegetable options, which didn't used to exist. Um, so uh, there is that option now. Now they still serve, you know, foods that they know is going to sell. And the reality is they outsource their their nutrition services to a third party company. Uh, but but they've been open to listening to me. And, and and when I use reason, which has to do with the health of the people and that we shouldn't be serving people the very food that put them there in the first place, uh, that sometimes gets their attention. Um, I've, I've had discussions with them about uh, processed meats and how those are class one carcinogens. Uh, and, and they don't know it. They don't know that processed meats are the same uh, class one carcinogen as asbestos, plutonium and tobacco. But once they hear that, it starts to make an impact and uh, you see that being served less. I do think that we can continue to make an impact uh, through just consistent sharing the message and I call it planting seeds. They may not be ready, but eventually you keep planting those seeds and you keep planting those seeds and someday one of those seeds is going to take root and grow uh, and, 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 and have an impact. There's two other hospitals I'm working with who are extremely excited that I uh, relate cardiovascular disease and nutrition, and they want me to give regular talks to their patients, their patients' families, their staffs, and the community um, on, on, the, on the health benefits of a healthier nutrition. And so, I, I, you know, I think we are, we are be, uh, you know, just through persistence, uh, uh, we can make a difference. I'll give you uh, an interesting thing is that about six or seven years ago when I became fully plant-based, it was quite apparent because I, I work in a small to medium-sized hospital and we all sit around in the doctor's lounge and we eat and people would recognize that I wasn't putting any meat on my, on my dish uh, and it, it would come up and before long, everyone understood Riz is uh, now whole food plant-based and Riz is a vegan. And, um, and, and, and you know, they quite literally thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. They just thought I was nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you going to get your protein? You're going to waste away. You're, you're not going to be healthy. You're going to be pale. You're not going to have any strength. And, um, you know, fast forward four or five or six years, and now I am the nutritional expert at my hospital. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, every, everybody comes to me for health advice, for, for nutritional advice. Uh, you know, the very few people that I have problems with are the keto guys. Keto right. and carnivore may work for short-term results, but will undermine your long-term health. There have been no long-lived populations on earth that have eaten extreme animal-based diets. By the way, this is the amount of oatmeal that'll eat over the course of a week. The Maasai and Inuit have been trotted out as the poster children for keto and carnivore. But what they don't tell you is that these people only live into their early 40s. Keto and carnivore are short-term gain for long-term pain. And, and you know, you know I, I'm not one to get into these really, really heated arguments. Mm -hmm. um, I do enjoy a good discourse and the... And the uh, uh, and the presentation of real data. And this is all backed up by data. And the things that, that I do are uh, evidence-based and data-driven. Um, and so it's not just making up, it's not a fad, it's not Weight Watchers, it's not mm -hmm. you know the keto diet or the paleo diet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will have, if people want to engage me, I have good conversations and I have the data to back it up uh, and uh, but I don't get into fights with people about this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
if if they're in that if that's where they are they're not ready to hear the message you're right right yeah yeah I, it's a little disturbing i mean the like the extreme version of the low carb diet that's a fad right now is this carnivore thing where you eat nothing but meat yeah and i i find it's a little disturbing because these uh influencers have large followings yes and i think part uh -huh. of the problem with it is that people that are eating a standard American diet, they el eliminate everything except meat, and then they lose weight, and they might actually feel better. And they think, oh, meat is a magic food. But mm -hmm. neglecting the fact that they've eliminated all of this other garbage with additives and whatnot, and uh, uh, they falsely attribute it to meat, when, of course, if they had done the same thing and eliminated everything except maybe potatoes and some vegetables, from a weight loss point of view, they might have even done better, but their health would actually be improved, even on a simple vegan diet like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the other thing is, they, I noticed that a lot of these pundits, like they really focus on the cardiovascular thing and they deny the relationship between cholesterol, saturated fat and heart disease. Um, and he, I did a video, I said, okay, even if they were right about that, that there's no relationship between saturated fat, cholesterol, and heart disease, what about these other things, you know, brain health, gut health, overall mortality, like all cause mortality, it's not just about cardiovascular mortality, but all cause mortality is impaired on a low carbohydrate diet significantly, it's like 30 or 40% difference. Um, and so, I mean, if they're going to make a strong case, they've got to answer to that as well. Um, right, right. But I think it's kind of one of these things. It's a short term gain. Um, you know, atherosclerosis is a slow disease and uh -huh. you may feel fine. I mean, I was a poster child. I used to eat tons of meat. I mean, I was just obsessed with protein and whatnot. And I was I was very strong. I felt fine. Uh, but my cholesterol was 330. Um, uh, I was pre-diabetic. My LPA was elevated. Um, it's st still elevated, but it's, you know, as you know, there's limits on what you can achieve with that. Uh, but I felt perfectly fine, you know, absolutely perfectly fine. But that doesn't mean that I couldn't just drop dead from a heart attack because, you know, what mm -hmm. is close to 50% of the time, the first symptom of, of heart disease is, is a heart attack. Death is death. Well, the first symptom of a heart attack is death 50% of the time. That's what I meant. Yeah. That's what yeah, I yeah, meant. Yeah. 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 So, um, uh, but. It, but uh, I got into it because I uh, stumbled across Dr. Michael Gregor's, you know, how not to die. And mm -hmm. I was, I was just blown away by the connection between nutrition and health that had never really been emphasized in any of my medical education. Um, yeah. And I, I knew I had this problem with high cholesterol. I was reluctant to go on a statin because my father had um, uh, myositis and ultimately died from it. Uh, oh, wow. possibly, mm -hmm. possibly from taking a statin. So I was like to take yeah. a statin. So I jumped right in and, you know, the cholesterol plummeted and I, you know, I, I was pretty lean and I got even leaner and my, you know, endurance improved and whatnot. And so I was just solely, totally sold on it, but yeah, I'm kind of the same. I mean, when I have a conversation with people, you know, just put some facts out there. Don't, um, there's no point arguing, um, just plant seeds as, as you say. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and to kind of speak to some of the things you said, um, you know, anytime anybody pays attention to their diet, mm -hmm. they're gonna, they're gonna do better mm -hmm. because oftentimes they do eliminate a lot of the bad things, the processed foods and stuff like that. So even uh, a paleo diet, a carnivore diet, um, any of these diets, um, they are eliminating processed foods and sugars and a lot of, uh, a lot of bad things so they too tend to improve uh but i don't think that there's that they understand that concept of the long-term damage that's being done internally they mm -hmm. they like that short-term gain mm -hmm. uh, but they don't understand the long-term uh negativity to it so that's that's one of the things that i don't see and and then again the data doesn't support it you are not going to find any data any long-term data on um, meat-based diets being healthy for you. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that's the case is because no one will stay on a meat-based diet for years. And, mm -hmm. and when they've done them, they've shown that they are not healthy for you. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, again, in science, not every study is always going to turn out exactly perfect. 
But the way in science we work is we work on the preponderance of the data, right? And and the preponderance of the data uh, is 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 in favor of a healthy whole food approach to lifestyle. And uh, I mean, when I say preponderance, I mean we're talking ninety percent. It's not a fifty-one forty-nine mix. I mean it's a ninety ninety-five percent thing. Um, and uh, you know, I, interestingly enough, I'm into longevity now. Uh, I, I do I do a lot of speaking on longevity, and uh, I study that. And essentially, all of the world's longevity experts mm-hmm. say that a whole food, plant based diet is the is the basis of living longer and healthier. Mm-hmm. You will not find a longevity expert who will tell you that eating meat is the basis of living longer. Mm-hmm. I think that's telling. And I'm not talking about internet influencers. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about world-class PhDs from Stanford, MIT, and Harvard who have spent their lifetimes studying these things. And, and, and these are the conclusions they've made from doing hundreds and thousands of studies. So again, uh, you know, when, when we talk about these influencers, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that they, they had this audience. Mm-hmm. And, but also I think a lot of times people are just looking for something to justify their behaviors. So they latch on to these things. Um, but getting back to it, uh, one thing, as a surgeon, I'm this kind of guy who likes to just cut out disease. Mm-hmm. And I'm not this long term, let's take a long term, figure it out. It's like, okay, you got a cancer, let me cut it out. You got a carotid blockage, let me fix it. You got a, a blockage in your artery, let me put a stent in it. I'm into fix, uh, quick fixes. Our behaviors are behaviors that have been set in stone for decades. Mm-hmm. And they are so um, ingrained in us. And there's so many factors that are related to it. It's cultural, it's social. I mean, we have social pressures from our friends to eat and drink in certain ways. Our families, we grew up in families that ate a certain way. Uh, When my family, my family as a Pakistani family, when they came over to the United States, they weren't largely meat eaters because they couldn't afford meat, okay? Mm -hmm. But as my dad became more affluent and more uh, successful, meat became part of our everyday meals. Mm -hmm. Uh, My wife, who is Mexican, uh, her family in Mexico, they eat mostly a plant-based approach to to eating. Uh, And they are all skinny and healthy, and they live into their 80s and 90s. Her family that lives here in the United States, they eat the standard American diet, and they all have, they all battle obesity and diabetes and hypertension. Um, They all have had their gallbladders taken out. Uh, and so, uh, uh, within that same family unit, two different lifestyles have led to two different types of health, uh, outcomes. And, Mm -hmm. and so it's the social things, it's behavioral things, it's cultural things. Um, and those are very, very difficult things to address and change. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so as a surgeon, that's where I was getting at is I can't just cut it out. We have to learn. We have to learn ways to get to people, um, and and get to their whys and affect their behaviors. And that's why we talk about cognitive behavioral therapies uh, and, and things like that. Uh, which uh, for you and me, we're proceduralists, which is it's a little bit different and foreign to us. Um, uh, but um, but I've learned uh, that uh, by uh, by sitting and talking with my patients and finding their whys. Uh, talking to them about, do you want to live longer? Do you want to live healthier? Do you want to be around for your grandchildren? Do you want to not have a stroke? Um, uh, You can kind of finally help them identify uh, things that then help them make small changes that move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But it's still hard. They go to the 4th of July celebration and all that's cooking is hot dogs and hamburgers. uh, and, And, you know, what do they do? You and I, we take we take our own food to those things, okay? But uh, you know, uh, for them, it's 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 very hard. 
and uh, I've become very sympathetic uh, to uh, the general population and understanding why these changes don't occur. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that's why I say I'm out there not judging people mm -hmm. uh, as much as I'm just literally trying to continue to educate and plant those seeds. Yeah, I, th I think one of the things that makes it difficult, and I think you pointed this out in one of your videos on YouTube, was that, you know, at first, a plant-based diet can seem a little bland, but then you adjust. Yeah. And then, you know, there's this range of tastes that you were never really aware of that you then start to appreciate. And I think there has to be an expectation that, you know, on the first day, maybe it doesn't taste the greatest. Mm -hmm. Um but then your palate, the sensitivity of your palate broadens and you really start to appreciate things. I think I appreciate food more now than I ever did before, actually. When yeah, you're yeah. Sort of more salt, oil, sh sugar types of, um, you know, foods. And uh, so I think that there's some, you have to temper expectations somewhat. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, another area, uh, it, area that sort of comes to mind is from time to time, I'll talk to people that are diabetic or pre-diabetic and you tell them that well actually the solution is to go on a higher carbohydrate low fat diet mm -hmm. um, and that they just have difficulty wrapping their mind around that because the expectation is is that they have to modulate their carbohydrates to keep their blood sugar down which is only partially true um, yeah. in the context of a higher fat diet then then that is true. But if you really reduce the dietary fat, particularly saturated fat, your insulin works better. And the more carbs you take in, the better your blood sugar. I've, I've stated this several times um, on our videos, but I used to be pre-diabetic and within three or four days, I did like a whole uh, whole hog McDougal thing. Like it changed overnight. And my blood sugar went from, you know, high 90s, low 100s as a fasting to 65 in mm -hmm. about four days. It didn't take any longer than four days. I mean, I was fortunate, I, you know, was able to sort of recover that insulin function quickly, but that is something that's really ingrained in people. And they think that to keep the sugar down, they got to, you know, eat, eat more protein, eat more fat. Um, uh, since we're in the business of planting seeds, can you give your thoughts on protein? I'm, I'm sure you've been asked that a zillion times, Yeah. but I think it's worth reiterating because I know for myself, that was a major roadblock to me even considering the idea of a plant-based diet. What, what are your thoughts yeah. on protein? Well, in general, first off, we're dealing with uh, a, a, the information age where there's so much information out there uh, and, and it, a lot of it's disinformation. And, and, and people have a very hard time discerning what's right and what's wrong. And just because somebody speaks emphatically and they act like they know what they're talking about, Sometimes people just latch on and say, okay, they're an expert. They must know what they're talking about. And, and so we see, I see this all the time. And, uh, you know, so the thing about diabetes is that it really just takes some education at a basic level for people to understand what, you know, uh, you know, nine out of 10 of my primary care doctors don't know what causes type two diabetes. And I personally, as a vascular surgeon, cure more diabetes than my medical colleagues okay and it's frustrating and it's because they sit there and think that sugar is the problem not understanding that sugar is the symptom okay and uh and you know it's, so it takes some education and uh when i sit down and i talk to my patients and i tell them well the reality is it's the fat that's causing you to be intolerant and causing your uh, sugar to go up. They, they, they don't get it. And then you continue to explain it and get, uh, and then they start to understand. And if you can get them on board with it, they see the changes. Um, uh, but, they all, but, but see, the problem is our colleagues are telling them something completely different. So then who, who do they believe? And that's, that's a real problem in our world is that our doctors are telling patients different stories. And also, if you ask 10 different doctors about what's the best diet, you're going to get 10 different answers. 
uh, that also tells you something about the fact that there's a real strong lack of knowledge and understanding out there in the medical community about nutrition. And of course, we didn't get nutrition training in medical school. And they're, and they're doing a better job of it now, uh, and largely due to the efforts of people like you and me who are saying that needs to be a part of the curriculum. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, you know, so it's disinformation's out there and, and protein is a part of that disinformation. Okay. And, and, and this protein thing started over a hundred years ago when some guy who, and I can't even name his name, just arbitrarily came up with a, an amount of protein that he recommended was necessary on a daily basis. And then the, then the government adopted the RDA, the recommended daily amount of protein based on some of his work. Uh, and, and so it wasn't largely based on scientific fact. It was just this paper that was written by a guy, then the RD, then the, 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 I'm not sure if it's the FDA or the USDA, probably that then recommends what the RDAs are. Uh, and that's where it started. And um, now we largely know that to maintain your body, you just need 0 0.8 milligrams per kilogram of protein on a daily basis in order to maintain your body. So a little bit more for a man, a little bit uh, uh, less for a woman uh, based on your weight. Now, and protein can be adjusted based on your needs. So if you want to be a bodybuilder, yeah, you, and you want to build muscle, well, then you need some more protein, okay? And you might adjust that number up to 1.2 grams per kilo or 1.5 grams per kilo okay um, but these uh, but these numbers where you're you, you've got people shooting for 400 and 500 in a day because they think that all that protein is great for them well they don't understand at a very basic level that it's not being utilized and that it's just being wasted and and it's just being uh, excreted but it's also causing damage to their body. And we have this problem today where we have parents who are feeding their children high protein diets, and we're starting to see more kidney disease in these children at a younger age. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's, it's not parents purposefully trying to hurt their children, but it's they're, they're giving information, they're getting their information from the world, the internet, the YouTube, and, and they're, uh, they are unable to discern what is good information and what is bad information. And so then they're just sticking there and, and they're feeding their, their, their children high protein diets, thinking that's healthy. Okay. And then also everyone has this kind of uh, concept that carbohydrates are bad. And, and, um, um, and then, uh, and I'll speak to fats too, because there's the three basic constituents, protein, fats, and carbohydrates. There's three macronutrients that we eat on a daily basis, but they think carbohydrates are bad and they think we get fat from them. So they avoid bread and they avoid donuts and they uh, say potato chips and French fries are bad for you. But guess what? Uh, those are not carbohydrates. Those are mostly fat. You're taking a potato chip, you're taking a potato and frying it in fat. You're taking a French fry and frying it in fat. Okay, you're taking a donut, a piece of bread and frying it in fat. And what happens is you take this 60 uh, 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 grams of uh, 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 a potato, uh, or I'm sorry, 60 calories, you take the 60 calories of potato and you fry it in fat and suddenly you've made it 300 calories. And it's actually 240 calories of fat, but people somehow still think that's a carbohydrate. And so, uh, so they've, uh, I have this slide in one of my talks and I, I, I it's two halves and I say, uh, you know, uh, I show that on one half, it's donuts, candy, 
uh, and fried foods and potato chips and french fries. And on the other half, it's broccoli, uh, cantaloupe, watermelon, berries. And people don't understand that those are both carbohydrates, okay? But one's a healthy carbohydrate, and one's actually not really a carbohydrate. And you, uh, and so you can fill your stomach full of uh, healthy carbohydrates, which are fruits, and you're only going to eat uh, a few hundred calories, and you're going to feel full. So that's one thing I kind of point out to people about uh, a misconception that exists out there when they say that they're avoiding carbohydrates. Well, they're really avoiding uh carbohydrates that have been fried in oil and and mixed with a lot of sugar and that that then changes the composition and when if they would really eat a, a handful of blueberries and strawberries and watermelon and things like that they'd be very healthy for it uh the other thing is that you know uh our our population what they consider a low fat diet is is very interesting the standard american diet is somewhere between 30 and 40% fat. And then they think, okay, we're going to cut out half our fat, and now we're down to 20% uh, or 25% fat, and they think that that's a low-fat diet. And that's not a low-fat diet, okay? A low-fat diet is what you and I eat, which is through our diet, we get about 10% of our calories from fat. And that's adequate amount of fat. It provides us all the fat we need for our body's uses. Um, and uh, and then, uh, a, uh, you know, we, we largely live and function on carbohydrate as our primary source of energy, and we're healthy for it. Uh, and so, you know, there's, these, uh, there's just so many misconceptions that exist out there, and it's very hard to um, educate and fight those misconceptions. Regarding the protein, I, I changed my workout schedule, I think it was around August, uh, with more emphasis on heavier weightlifting, sort of heavier within the context of my, my age. Um, I used to do a lot of really heavy weightlifting when I was younger, and uh, uh, I've carefully you know, increased my strength, and my, I've gained substantial muscle, um, about 10 pounds since the summer, and I'm like a lot stronger and so, uh, you know, you look at that standard recommendation for dietary protein, 0 0.8 um, milligrams, sorry, 0 0.8 grams per kilo of lean body mass, which most people say that's way too much. But actually, that, you know, that's too full standard deviation above the mean requirement, which means that 98% of people that are at that level of intake are getting more than they actually need. And yet most people get you know, one and a half to twice that amount. So there's this huge buffer. And then like even the vegan bodybuilder types will say 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram of lean body mass to build muscle. But I wonder if that's actually too high. And I mean, I just did some, you know, back of the envelope calculations. If you were to build 10 pounds of lean muscle over the course of a year, you know, given that 72% of tissue is just water, I crunched numbers. You're only adding three point three. I think it was three point eight grams of protein to your body per day to do that, which is what you know, two or three tablespoons of peas or something like that. So, like, uh, why the why the discrepancy between the standard rec recommendation of zero point eight for the average person versus one point two to one point six for an athlete? I almost wonder if that that buffer is unnecessary. Yeah. So I um uh, I I can't. Uh, I, you know, when I don't know the answer to something, I'll be honest and tell you, mm -hmm. and I don't really know the answer to that, but I can make a conjecture, mm -hmm. and that's in, in the utilization of the protein that we eat, mm -hmm. okay? So, you know, not everything we put in our body is fully 100% absorbed and utilized, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So it might be that we have to take in that volume in order to actually utilize it. And also, utilization is also based on our physical activity. The less physical activity we are, the less protein we need, probably the more we excrete. But the more active we are, the more our body then will uh, absorb and then utilize that protein and put it into our muscle as we're building muscle. That's my kind of my teleal, uh, you know, my, ba you know, my guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, 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 e but either way, these numbers you're quoting are far lower 
than what the average American gets. The average American gets two to three times as much protein as they really need. Okay, uh, and 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 that's not healthy. Uh, it, uh, it's it's uh, it it certainly is not helping us, and then it's not healthy for the kidneys, for example. Um, we also know, uh, you and I know from a lot of studies that excessive protein intake, uh, especially meat protein, is responsible for many cancers. Mm -hmm. And and now there's a rise in colon cancer in our younger population under 40. And I think that's because the people under 40 are taking in high amounts of protein and it's leading to earlier onset of cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you an example. In uh, pre-World War II Japan, mm -hmm. colon cancer almost did not exist. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the Americans won the war and we colonized Japan and, uh, and fast food moved in and uh, meat became a central aspect of their, of their food when it wasn't before. Mm -hmm. uh, and now colon cancer in Japan is rampant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now, our genetics did not just change. Japanese genetics didn't change from World War II to today. Mm -hmm. Something else changed. And in my opinion, it was the diet. Okay, so I think it's the diet that was responsible for the change in that in that cancer. Uh, so you know, and, and and that was that we're eating more protein, and we know that, uh, for example, we know that uh, high protein intake is responsible for several GI tract cancers. We know that high alcohol intake is responsible for several GI tract cancers. So that we know that food in it, uh, bad foods. And the ones that we uh, recommend avoiding are responsible for many cancers that occur in our body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another good example, if you look at uh, uh, blacks in Africa, living in rural Africa, eating a very plant-based diet versus blacks in the United States, uh, I think that the colon cancer rate amongst American blacks is about 60 times yes. What, yes. what it is in, um, in Africa. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't tell you the exact number, but it's a multiple, multi a multiple of 10, some multiple of 10. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's actually a, a big number. But in my field of cardiovascular disease, something that was noticed early on by some of our earlier researchers and, and our granddaddies of plant-based nutrition is that um, they noticed that uh, people in Africa were not getting cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But in the United States, 40 to 50 percent of Americans were getting atherosclerosis in their heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they studied them, what they found is uh, that uh, the, the African population wasn't eating meat and they were eating 50 to 100 grams of, uh, of uh, fiber a day. Whereas the Americans were eating a high meat diet and they were getting less than 15 grams of fiber a day. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I, I point that out, and there are lots of studies to back this up now. So I point out to people that a high fiber, low meat diet is cardio protective. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, there, they, there are these studies, when you look at studies uh, on a spectrum of what your diet is, mm -hmm. from a whole food plant-based, 100% whole food plant-based purist, uh, to the standard American diet, or maybe even the carnivore diet, and what is your risk of cardiovascular disease and chronic disease? Mm -hmm. uh, and that that risk goes up 78% as you go up that scale. Uh, and that's an amazing, amazing uh, statistic mm -hmm. that you can reduce your risk of chronic disease, heart disease, and cancer by 80% by just changing the way you eat. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is amazing. And, uh, uh, you know, I wish the public, the mainstream healthcare system would embrace that and, and push those facts. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, well, you know, for me, like, I was kind of in the dark for years. And then I read Dr. Greger's book, and I, I kind of realized that what I was doing as a radiologist was looking at scan after scan after scan of lifestyle induced diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh and so it really got me motivated 
Now, just backtracking a little bit on the fats, do you have any um, opinions on the omega-3 fatty acids and any need for supplementation? Um, uh, yeah, kind of I think opinions that, on that? I do. I do have some opinions, and uh, but I'm open to saying that this is an area where we're still learning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, my opinion could change in the future. Um, I, I, right now, I work very hard to get all of them. First off, the omega-3, omega-6 thing. Let's explain this to our audience. Um, there's an ideal ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 uh, fats in our body. And that ideal ratio should be 3 to 1, 4 to 1, okay? Omega-6s to omega-3s. Omega-6 fats come mostly from our animal-based foods. And omega-3 uh, come mostly from our plant-based foods. And in, in the standard American, that ratio is 20 to 1, 30 to 1, 40 to 1. And that does affect your cardiovascular risk mm -hmm. tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, what you would like to do is bring that risk down to uh, a, a lower ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s. Well, it's real simple. One thing you can do is by eliminating many of the bad things in the standard American diet, you've reduced your omega-6s, mm -hmm. so your uh, ratio is automatically decreased, okay? Mm -hmm. But then the other thing you can do is increase your intake of omega-3s, mm -hmm. and that then also helps. And one way uh, many people can relate to this is, why do doctors recommend fish oil? Mm -hmm. Well, fish oil is omega-3 fatty, acid, fatty acids, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's increasing your fatty uh, omega-3 fatty acids in your body. Um, but I don't think the answer is to continue to eat this high level of omega-6s and then just really try to bring up your omega-3s to change your ratio. Mm -hmm. I think the better answer is to bring down your omega-6s because there's so many other health benefits in reducing processed foods and reducing meat. But so where do I get my omega-3s and where do I recommend? There's some, there's some food sources that are very high in omega-3s. And that's like walnuts, mm -hmm. chia seeds, um, and uh, flax seeds. Those have a lot of omega threes in them, um, and um, and so I add those to a lot of places in my diet. I ground up flax seeds and I put them in my uh, in my salad. It you know you don't taste it and it's there. Um, I add walnuts walnuts to my salads and other things. Um, I also uh, add flax seeds to my smoothies. And I ground them up because if you don't eat ground them up, they kind of come out whole and you haven't absorbed them. Right. So you can get omega threes that way uh, for one uh, as one example to really increase your omega three intake. Um, uh, so I do I do believe that uh, omega threes are important. Mm -hmm. um, there are some uh, in in full disclosure, there are some studies and concerns out there that as whole food plant-based people and as vegans, those of us who are also vegans, uh, we that we do not uh, absorb and utilize our omega-3s as well as other people. Um, but uh, there's been nothing that's been shown that that lower absorption rate has had any negative clinical effects. Mm -hmm. So it just may mean that we don't need to absorb as much. Mm -hmm. Just the same way I was saying, if you don't, if you're not building body muscle, maybe you don't need to absorb as much protein. Well, maybe we don't need to absorb as much omega-3. The best way to achieve your ideal ratio is to reduce your omega-6 intake and increase your omega-3 intake. And I don't recommend fish oil because um, uh, that's just an intermediary. The fish is just an intermediary. The fish gets his omega-3s from eating algae. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you can actually eat algae-based omega-3 supplements and get your uh, your omega-3s as well. So you don't have to eat a meat product uh, to get your omega-3s. So you don't have to eat something bad in order to get something good. Okay, right. yeah. Uh, yeah. just the same way you don't have to eat a steak to get protein. You can eat beans and legumes to get protein. So you're eating a steak, which is something bad to get your protein, or 
you can eat beans and legumes to get your protein and that's also extremely healthy for you mm -hmm. so uh yeah. that's kind of my approach to it we we started taking uh the algae based uh, omega 3s uh the concern being that you know some people may not sufficiently elongate those chains into dha and epa and uh, we, we were fortunate, we had a conversation with Dr. Furman, and he was quite adamant that you should have supplementation as a vegan of those uh, oils. So we, we added uh -huh. them in. And okay. uh, with the rationale that, you know, we're not uh, skipping the fish. And the primary motive being brain health um, rather than cardiovascular. Yeah. My understanding yeah. is that the idea that omega-3s are particularly helpful for cardiovascular disease has not been borne out. Do you agree with that statement? Or I agree 100%. There was a lot of push on that. And as a cardiovascular specialist, um, I used to push fish oil and omega-3s many, many years ago. Uh, but the data has not borne out uh, conclusively. Again, I talk about the preponderance of the data. Mm -hmm. And we have, we have studies that show, yes, it helps. We have lots of studies that say, no, it doesn't help. And so when you put those together, we're kind of in this nebulous, vague area where we don't know the answer. There's been some meta-analyses that have been done that uh, show one thing. There's been others that show another. There's been others that have been inconclusive. Mm -hmm. So from a cardiovascular health standpoint, um, uh, I, am, I, I think the jury is still out. And that's why I started this conversation by saying I am open and I still think there's more data and more studying that needs to be done. Now, I do think that there's a lot of push and evidence uh, for omega threes and the, and therefore uh, DHA and uh, and those things for uh, brain health mm -hmm. uh, and I follow some of my good friends the Schur's eyes uh, very closely and they're strong proponents of yeah. of getting some uh, some oil uh, to get that uh, to get those uh, uh, omega threes um, again I still think that we are early on. Mm -hmm. in our understanding of all this. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to make any hard conclusions. Um, uh, and, but one thing I will say is that even you and I, in our daily diet, we get oil in our diet, mm -hmm. okay? We get oil through avocados and olives, and there's, there's a little bit of oil in almost everything we eat. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are getting a fair amount of oil, and then we're eat, eating flax seeds that has oil, our nuts, our fats and oils. Mm -hmm. So we are getting a fair amount of uh, fat in our diet. Uh, and so I'm not so sure that we have to significantly supplement our diet. And, and what, I, what I see that happens is when someone hears supplement your diet with oil, mm -hmm. well, they don't just add one teaspoon. Mm -hmm. They suddenly sprinkle half a bottle of vinegar and oil on their salad, and right. now they're overdoing it, and now they're hurting themselves. Right. So I think we have to be very, very um, cognizant of what we mean by supplementing our diet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, a lot of times people use these statements as free license to to do what they want rather than just being very, very careful about what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that the, and, and I actually, I had a, a big interview that I did um, uh, with a, 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 a couple called Out of the Doldrums. Mm. Uh, that's their website. Uh, that's their uh, YouTube. And we had a very nice discussion on, on uh, Omega-3. So if anybody wants to look that up, their, okay. their website is called Out of the Doldrums. Uh, they live in Hawaii. And every time we go there, we visit with them. I love them. They're a great couple and very intelligent. Uh, they're plant-based uh, in their lifestyle. And, and there's a very good discussion we had on, uh, on omega-3s, omega-6s, and, and that kind of stuff. So if you want more information on that, at least my belief set on that, go check that out. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, now, uh, I looked at your website, loveandbalance.org, and you you pointed out that you know for a healthy lifestyle, it's it's you you encourage a whole food plant based, but also you uh, talked about the importance of sleep, stress, and activity. Maybe you could mm -hmm. give a comment or two on on those things. To, uh, just to thank you, thank 
thank you for asking because life is not all just about what we eat. Right. Okay. I, I think it's a great aspect of what it is. It's the most common out. Uh, it's the most common thing we put in our bodies on a daily basis for our entire lives. So it probably is the number one factor that influences our health. You are, we are what we eat. Okay. I mean, that's, that's just so simple. It's just so easy to believe. Okay. Our body composition is what we put in our body, but, but um, uh, I am a lifestyle medicine advocate and there are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine and and this really started when I discovered the blue zones, okay? And the blue zones are these areas of the world where we have people who live longer and healthier. Uh, kind of statistically, they have the highest number of centenarians in the world, the people who live to be 100, uh, and yet they're healthy. And these areas are Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Greece, uh, Loma Linda, in, in California, uh, the, uh, uh, Costa Rica, uh, and um, and I left out uh, uh, Greece, Icaria, Greece. Uh, yeah, those are the five places in the world. And and when they studied those places, they found common characteristics uh, of the people, despite the fact that they were all over the world and very tremendous variety in their lifestyles. And what they ate, what they figured out is that there was these pretty much nine common characteristics that these people had. And the vast, the number one was that they ate a plant slant diet. Now, I'm not going to lie and say it was a 100% whole food plant-based diet. But when, when you say plant slant, it was 95, 96, 98% plants. Okay. Uh, and then, but then there was other things that were important. They got good sleep. They got exercise. Uh, they had ways of managing stress. Um, they had good relationships. And so this really resonated with me when I found out about this. And then the next step was, as I found out about the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And, and that was an organization here in the United States that incorporated the basics of those tenets into their pillars of belief. And theirs are exactly this, and that's nutrition, mm -hmm. sleep, exercise, avoidance of toxic behaviors, stress management, and relationships. Mm -hmm. And and what does that mean? Okay, well, we've talked a lot about the nutrition. And I think the nutrition is the low-hanging fruit. It's the easy thing to get to. It's the thing you can do that has the biggest impact on your health. But that doesn't mean that those other things are not important. And um, as a surgeon, I used to be so proud of myself that I could stay up 36 hours and 48 hours. Okay. Um, I was like, yeah, I'll stay up all night. I can operate for 30 hours, 36 hours straight. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm God. Okay. And, 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 um, and, and it wasn't until my later years that I understood how what a really bad attitude that was mm -hmm. and, and how much I was hurting myself mm -hmm. and also not being my best mm -hmm. to provide care for my patients. Mm -hmm. Sleep is important. There's a reason we sleep. It's restorative. Mm -hmm. And there's things that happen to us when we sleep uh, that uh, help us heal and get better. Um, I mean, if, if we didn't need sleep, the grand creator would not have created it as a part of our process. Okay. So sleep is really important. Um, and then uh, uh, stress management. Mm -hmm. um, stress is an important part of our lifestyles, but stress existed for, you know, let's go back a few thousand years. When the saber-toothed tiger was chasing us, we needed that adrenaline rush so that we could run away from it, okay? And our cortisol went up and our adrenaline went up and we had that stress response and we got away from it. But today... We're under a different type of stress. We're stressed all the time. We're stressed by work. We're stressed by our kids. We're stressed by uh, the traffic on the way home. And so we are um, we're experiencing stress in a different way, and it affects our stress hormones in a different way. Um, and also, by the way, sleep also affects our stress hormones, especially cortisol. Mm -hmm. And so good sleep patterns uh, impact that as well. So uh, managing our stress 
is extremely important. And 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 I and I am a big advocate for things that manage our stress, such as exercise, meditation, and yoga, and doing things where we can um, calm ourselves down and find ways not to be always on a, at a high level of stress. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm not saying that stress isn't important. It's just that we shouldn't be exp uh, uh, exposed to these stress hormones 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, they have their purpose, but mm -hmm. uh, but 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 not just continuously around the clock. Mm -hmm. And then um, so uh, avoidance of toxic behaviors, and, and what I'm talking about there is alcohol mm -hmm. and drugs. And, 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 you know, there can be, you know, risky behaviors, riding in a motorcycle, driving fast, but, you know, the alcohol and the drugs, um, alcohol has become very accepted in our society. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a variety of reasons for that. And that in and of itself could be a four or five hour conversation you and I could have. But let's just say alcohol is a part of our society and it's accepted. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not only accepted, it's celebrated. Right. But the, but the reality is alcohol is a toxin. It's a poison. And when we put it in our bodies, it gets converted into glutaraldehyde, which is a, a poison to our body. Uh, and alcohol is widely known to cause about 10 to 12 cancers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, not only does it cause cirrhosis, but it causes esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, pancreatic cancer. Um, and so um, uh, not to mention uh, the, the negative effects of alcohol in our lifestyles and uh, in, in all the deaths that occur to uh, accidents, drunk driving accidents and other things. But, uh, but alcohol really is a poison mm -hmm. that we put in our bodies on a daily basis. And uh, no amount of alcohol is safe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so alcohol is widely known to be a significant risk factor in breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So when I lecture on breast cancer, I explain to people that avoidance of alcohol is one of the best things you can do to reduce your breast cancer um, uh, uh, risk. Mm -hmm. And breast cancer is the most common cancer in women. One in nine women in their lifetimes will get breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So there are things that women can do to avoid breast cancer, uh, avoid alcohol, exercise, eat a plant-based diet, and maintain a healthy weight. Those are all extremely important in reducing your risk of breast cancer. So that's avoidance of risky behaviors. Uh, but then um, I talked about uh, uh, re uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, and relationships... Um, uh, you know, I don't think we were a species that was meant to uh, exist in, in isolation. Uh, we are a social being, and these relationships are helpful. And this is what we've seen in the Blue Zones. They have communities, uh, and they live together, they work together, they help each other. And there is something about that that helps you live longer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then um, uh, uh, lastly, um, I... Uh, 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 I, I, I think, uh, well, oh yeah, exercise. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I will, I will add to this relationships. I throw spirituality into that, mm -hmm. and that there's there's overlap in all of these things I talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, exercise for me is also zen-like and meditative. When I go running, I go into a different zone. Mm -hmm. I leave all my stress behind. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I let go of so much, um, and so there is some overlap in a lot of these things. But okay, so exercise is really is really important to us, uh, and uh, you know if I had to rank it up there, and I would put it, you know, nutrition number one, but sleep and exercise number two, okay. And we do need some exercise, uh, and 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 not this bodybuilder kind of mentality uh, or marathoner mentality that exists today that is so much pushed by social media and stuff. Exercise is something as simple as getting out there and walking a couple of miles a day at a brisk pace, mm -hmm. not r running 13 miles at seven minutes a mile. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and resistance exercise is also important for us because as we age, we lose our muscle mass. Mm -hmm. uh, we lose our protein. 
And so it is a little bit important also to increase our protein intake as we get older a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's important for us to do resistance exercise to maintain our strength because as we get older, we get weaker. And you see these patients and people who can't even get up out of the chair because they're so weak. We call that Gower sign. Um, and um, I, so uh, a couple of times a week, take some dumbbells, do some exercises, do some push-ups, uh, do some sit-ups. Again, not Arnold Schwarzenegger bodybuilding type of stuff, but stuff that just maintains our uh, body mass and our lean body mass and our ability to function. And, 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 th and this helps with things like, uh, uh, it also helps with the strength of our bones and osteoporosis. Um, uh, the United States has a very high rate of uh, fractures and hip fractures. People think that they, uh, we drink dairy for the calcium, but the United States has the highest hip fracture rate in the world, mm -hmm. okay? But we also have the highest dairy intake rate in the world, mm -hmm. okay? Put those two things together, and somehow somebody, some people think drink milk and you're going to have stronger bones. Well, that's not true, mm -hmm. okay? And you can get all the calcium you need and healthier calcium from a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's me covering kind of the six pillars of uh, lifestyle medicine, which I think all of those things are important yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in, 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 in creating a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And as time goes on and we do more and more videos, like we're going to explore all of these other things. Uh, just a couple thoughts that like uh, I put Joyce on a strength training program uh about late summer half an hour three times a week half an hour tops mm -hmm. and uh you know just incredible strength increases with just half an hour three times a week i mean you could even yeah. probably do less um, yeah I, I i go hard on the weights but like i i really enjoy it and i'm but i'm yeah. careful um yeah I, I it's not really necessary that people do that but just something i like to do and I'm like you, when I'm lifting weights, I go in this total Zen state. Like I don't even want music because I'm just in my head about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that in itself is, is therapeutic, but yeah. uh, uh, the sleep thing, we're going to explore that too, because uh, I've recently become very interested. I've had a suspicion for 20 years that I have at least 20 years that I've had sleep apnea. And uh, I, over the course of those 20 years, I would time to time see a sleep doctor and I got three opinions and all three times said, uh, it's really unlikely, you know, you're not overweight. Um, they didn't even think a sleep study was worthwhile. Well, mm -hmm. uh, we moved to this, uh, moved to Iowa uh, back last spring. And so I started a new dental practice and the dentist looked at me and he says, you've got a lot of wear on your teeth. You're grinding your teeth. And I said, oh yeah, I know mm -hmm. I do that. Like under periods of stress, I would get this facial pain, but it's hard. That's hardly ever a problem. Well, he says, you're doing it more in a little bit. And that could be a sign of sleep apnea. So the mm -hmm. dentist basically did this evaluation and sent me for a sleep study. And I have mild sleep apnea, which explains what I've been trying to figure out for about for decades, why I have this inappropriate afternoon sleepiness. Uh -huh. um, and so actually I go in in a couple of days and I get fitted for, fitted for a, a dental appliance, um, you know, to move my mandible forward when I'm sleeping. And uh, anyways, I'm really looking forward to it. But, you know, 80% of people with sleep apnea never get diagnosed. Um, right, right. And, and sleep uh, apnea is, is rampant now in our society because of obesity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and we didn't even speak about the relationship of obesity to diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that fact that it's that increased fat in the body that's causing the type 2 uh, 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 it's causing the insulin resistance, causing type two diabetes. And mm -hmm. that's why any diet, when you lose weight, helps mm -hmm. cure your type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so, so in full disclosure, I'm going to tell everybody I own Apple stock. Now, why am I telling you that? Because I'm about to show you uh, my uh, app, Apple watch. Okay. And this changed my life. Really? Okay. Uh, and, and it's, all I, I'm all about the data, okay. Mm -hmm. And if you can collect data on your health, mm -hmm. then you can say, okay, I can make changes, and then you can see what those changes do for you. Mm -hmm. And I was classically always a bad sleeper, 
Mm. And that's a consequence of me being a surgeon. Last night, I got woken up at 4 a.m. for a carotid dissection with a carotid occlusion with a patient who had an uh, MCA stroke. Okay. Oh. And, 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 you know, no matter how hard I try to sleep well, I'm always getting disturbed. And, but what I found out when I bought this watch and I put it on and I started wearing it at night is that I was getting four hours and eight minutes of sleep a night, which is c completely inadequate. Okay. Right. But, but also it fed into my mentality of being a proud surgeon that I can do anything mm -hmm. with, without sleep. Um, but also I have evolved and I had begun to understand that sleep is so important. And what this did is it allowed me to number one, first gauge how much sleep I was getting. Mm -hmm. And then it allowed me to start making changes uh, to get more sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether it was, and I was like you, I was always falling asleep and I would get home from work at 6.30 or 7 mm -hmm. and I'd sit down and I'd fall asleep. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I couldn't go to sleep and then I wouldn't get enough sleep and it was this bad cycle. So it allowed me to really focus on making changes in my lifestyle to really try to get better sleep. Uh, I, I, I worked hard not to take naps. I started to work hard to go to bed a little bit earlier. I started to work hard to get up at a very, very specific early time every single morning. Mm -hmm. um, I read uh, or, or listened to the Huberman podcast, mm -hmm. and he does a lot of stuff on sleep, and I, I really admire some of his work. And one of the things I like to do is I get up in the morning, and I get out there, and I watch that sunrise, and I get that few minutes of exposure to sunlight in the morning, which resets your circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, the, in a matter of less than a year, I went from four hours and eight minutes of sleep a night to seven hours of sleep a night. Okay. Now, granted, I still get disturbed a lot because I'm a surgeon and I get woken up at night and I have emergencies, but um, I'm still better able to manage things. And I also found out through this what my ideal sleep time is. Mm -hmm. And my ideal sleep time is seven hours and 15 minutes. I know if I go to bed, at um uh at uh 6 30 uh i'm not 6 30 11 30 mm -hmm. and i get up seven hours and 15 minutes later um i will be perfectly tired tomorrow night mm -hmm. at 11 30 and ready to go to bed mm -hmm. so i've kind of find i kind of found what my appropriate wake sleep cycle is and so it helps me be more regular in my lifestyle so mm -hmm. this I love. Uh, so I love this device. It doesn't have to be an Apple. You can buy a Fitbit or an Aura or some whatever else. But I love the data, and this gives me feedback data on my heart rate. Mm -hmm. um, I put my blood pressure in here. Um, there's so many things. My resting heart rate, my activity heart rate. I can measure how much I walk per day, how many steps per day I get. It gives me a lot of data on all these lifestyle things that I like to do, um, and so. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate for uh, uh, obtaining data and using that data to help change your lifestyle. Yeah, maybe I should be doing that, you know, myself, like um, tracking my sleep sort of before and after I get this appliance for my sleep apnea. Yeah, that would it'll be help you see interesting. Yeah. Just, yeah. it'll just be very interesting to know. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I had, I, what I did is I bought one online. They're not as good because um, the bottom tray loosened and I would wake up and I wasn't probably holding my jaw in place. It uh -huh. was about four or five nights. I thought I really noticed a huge difference, but then it stopped working for that reason. Um, but once I get the, the professionally made yeah. appliance, it'd be interesting to do a before and after. But anyways, this has been a fantastic. I bet your dentist is going to, your dentist is going to make, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say the dentist is going to make the best one for you. Yeah. Yeah. I go in either on Tuesday or Wednesday, I get the fitting. Uh, but this yeah. has been a fantastic conversation. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, perhaps we could do it again sometime. Uh, I would love to, you know, there's just so much to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, I love sharing this information. And, uh, you know, uh, like I said, uh, 
you know, we're out here to share what I think is meaningful information. There's nothing in this for you and me. We're not making money off of this. We're not trying to get famous off of this. Uh, all we're trying to do is help people understand a better way to live. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so I'm always happy to participate and I'll be happy to join you anytime I can. Okay, great. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.